Let's do it. Okay, thank you, Drew. We are recording. Uh, thank everybody for our our last virtual uh, meeting here. Um, I, I I think probably some of you lament that like I do, but uh, it is what it is. And uh, we'll be back into live meetings in March. Uh, Drew uh, acknowledged on the agenda that we've got uh, the old dates on there for meetings. So obviously it'd be the fourth Monday over at King Street in March for the next meeting. And uh, to kick it off, what we've start, what we've done uh, since I've been chair anyways is really brief introductions. So I'll start. My name's uh, John Bly. I've been associated with this group for about, I don't know, 13 years or so. And uh, I run the Engineering Contractors Association and chair this committee meeting. So let's go right on through. Tom, you're next. Self-introduction. Hi, Hi, Tom, Tom. Conlon. Oh, wrong Tom. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> go with Tom Conlon first. Sorry, Tom Banny. Hi there, uh, Tom Conlon, uh, representing the Sonoma County Conservation Coalition here in Sonoma Valley. Thank you, Tom Banny. Hi, Tom Banning, 3rd District. Been here about three or four years. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Drew. Uh, Drew Nichols, clerk of the board for SCTA and RCPA. And Denny Harder, the great Denny Harder. Great. Dennis Harder, representing Sonoma County Alliance. Robin Bartholow. Hi there, John. Robin Bartholow, Sonoma County Farm Bureau. I've been here about four months. Welcome. And our parliamentarian, Rick Lutman. Yeah, I live in Warner Park and I represent the Sonoma chapter of the League of Women Voters. Okay. Um, we'll just go right through those as they appear on here. Our, our guest today is Janice Thompson. Janice, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Janice Thompson. I'm the deputy director at Sonoma County Public Infrastructure. That's our new department name. We are formerly Transportation and Public Works. Thank you. That's going to take some getting used to, Janice. <laughs> Hopefully you cut me a little slack on that one. So, Of course. Thank you. Ross? Uh, Ross Clonetta, RCPA, SCTA. Okay. Welcome. Gina Erickson? Gina Erickson, State Council on Development and Municipal Needs, uh, representative of... Uh, the, the pug and uh, uh, I wear many ha other hats as well. Thank you for joining us, Gerald. I'm Jerry Glazer and I represent the North Bay Electric Auto Association and it's probably my fifth meeting. Welcome, Adam Garcia. Adam Garcia, data analyst at SCTA RCPA. My old friend, Brian Lang. Brian Lang, uh, representing the 4th District. Okay. Welcome, Kathleen. Hi, I'm Kathleen Cortez. I'm with Sonoma County Area Agency on Aging. Good to see you again, Natalie. Hi, Natalie Higley, representing the North Bay Central Labor Council. Cool, thank you for joining us, Tanya. Good afternoon, I'm Tanya Nara, Director of Climate Programs for the RCPA. And Eris, hello, Eris. Hi, I'm Eris Weaver. I'm the executive director of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. Welcome. And there's an old friend, Steve Bertelbaugh. Yes, Steve Bertelbaugh representing the Sierra Club. Thank you. Welcome. Dana, Terry. Dana Trey, senior transportation planner at Sonoma County Transportation Authority. Thank you. Chris. Chris Barney, SETA. Afternoon, everyone. Hello, and David. Muted, but we know who you are. Thank you for joining us, Shana. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Shana Gauz, Sonoma County Transportation Authority, Senior over Programming and Projects. Thank you. Mr. Soylent. Greetings, Mark Soylent. I'm representing Supervisor Rabbit's District. Hello, everybody. Howdy. James. James Cameron with the Sonoma County Transportation Authority. Terrific. Celesta, did I pronounce that right? 
You did. Hi, my name's Celesta. I'm just listening in to learn more about the SETA RCPA. Cool. All right. Thank you guys for joining us on this. Uh, is I assume it's wet back there, and I heard it's cold. So, thank you guys. And um, that's it for introductions. Public comment. Does anybody have any public comment? If not, we'll get right into the administration items. And uh, we're looking for. I heard somebody pipe up there. Yeah, I see uh, Tom Conlin with his hand up. Okay, great. Thank you. I got to go back to. Thanks, John. Awkward part about these uh, Zoom meetings. Sometimes I miss them. Yeah, Todd. Thanks, John. Hi. Um, I just wanted to refer my appreciation to staff. I had some public inquiries uh, between our last meeting and now, and uh, one of those had to do with a request. I'll take care of it. For an alternative bus route. And I was able to forward that to Dana and uh, get those folks talking. So thank you for that. And also there was some confusion about the meetings, uh, but how our meetings, various meetings of SCTA and RCPA appear on this, the website. And so both of those concerns were forwarded to staff. And I just wanted to take this moment to, to make that clear. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Yeah, we do have a good staff here. Uh, and we're up to... Um... Uh, Drew, you want to uh, run the uh, approval of the minutes section here for us? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so I have the, before you in the agenda packet, the meeting notes from January 30th for uh, your approval. Um, just need a motion and a section, a second and an action from the committee. And nor if there are any corrections as well that need to be made. I'll make a motion to, to accept the minutes as presented. I'll second. Any discussion? Uh, all those in favor, signify by raising your hand, thumbs up, saying aye. 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 Any opposition? Abstain. I will also abstain since I wasn't there. Okay. All right. I will also abstain. Two abstentions, three abstentions. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Ross, one of our more exciting uh, presentations is going to be on the Brown Act update. Let's hear about it. Yeah, this is, I'm going to keep this brief as we've been hearing a lot about this, but just to make it very clear, um, with the COVID-19 state of emergency ending tomorrow, February 28th, um, I'd like to very briefly go over the CAC meeting attendance attendance options going forward. And um, like I said, apologies for the repetition, but it's a, a big change for all of us. We wanna make sure the transition goes as smoothly as possible. So beginning in March, CAC and all other Brown Act meeting attendance options are as follows. In number one is in person at the SCTA boardroom at 411 King Street here in Santa Rosa. Uh, this is the preference if possible. Um, the second option is traditional Brown Act teleconference, which requires at least a quorum of the committee members participating from locations within the jurisdiction, um, with the locations uh, included in the agenda and open to the public with meeting notices posted in advance. Um, so that will require some communication with Drew in advance and also um, your wherever you are um, attending from does need to be noticed and open to the public. Um, an example of this would be using existing public locations such as city council chambers or similar, although private residences can be used, but they must be publicly noticed and accessible. Uh, two other options exist under the new Assembly Bill 2449. These are just cause and emergency circumstances. Um, and can just be used for no more than two meetings. Um, advance notice and committee approval is also required, but public access is not necessary. Uh, please see the Brown Act summary in this month's CAC packet. Um, committee meetings will continue to be publicly accessible via, via Zoom. Committee members who are unable to participate under traditional teleconference or AB 2449 can virtually attend as members of the public, but will be unable to take actions or count towards the quorum. Uh, please review the attached summary that's in the agenda and uh, definitely let us know if you have any questions and we 
look look forward to seeing folks in person. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, I suspect there might be one or two others, but I'd like to go ahead and we, we do need committee approval of this from what I understand. I'm going to exercise my two emergency meetings because I've got two trips planned before I knew we were going back to uh, uh, live only. And I have talked to Mosa Abbasi to ask if he would substitute in for me for the April and the July meetings. I will be out of state and out of country, so I will not be able to be here in person. And Mosa says he'll do that, uh, no problem. I'll be participating virtually, but uh, just as a member of the public for those two meetings. Um, so I guess I need a motion and second for that. To be considered. Uh, Chair Bly, to, to attend as a, a member of the public, you do do not need approval. Yeah, okay, I might, I might have misunderstood yeah. that if we are going to exercise the two emergent or one or two emergency meetings, that we needed the approval of this committee. Yeah, that um, approval yeah. can be made at the meeting the day of. Oh, the date of. The day of. We can't get it out of the way now, so we don't have to deal with it in the future. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, no, um, Mosa could ask for it on the date of then. <laughs> yeah. Long, long as Drew's, Drew's notified and, and uh, yeah, we'll figure out whether the just cause or emergency circumstances would be the appropriate channel. Okay. Um, and the other thought I had was, I don't, I haven't heard from anybody, but uh, this is not only a hardship for me to be there in person, it's a hardship for others to be there in person. Does that change anybody's um, status of remaining on this committee? It's a hardship for me. I, I, I'm in wheelchair. It's hard for me to get around. Okay, Gina, so I would ask Ross and uh, if we, how do we accommodate that? We'll take a look and, and see what the best option is. We can certainly, we can certainly use our, the 2AB2449. Uh, we can use that to get through the next two meetings and then see if there's a possibility to go traditional. I mean, I'd love to stay on the committee. I, I, I really like this committee. I just don't know if I can um, fit my wheelchair in, in, in a small room like that and be, you know. Understood, although we, we are we are accessible at the uh, SETA office, um, but definitely understood, understand it's a hardship and this is not our preference, but it's what, what we have to follow. Um, but we'll look into the options and try kind of try to lay out the best best options for you. I don't mind um, having my 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 home that's is closed on the on the agenda if that's that's helpful. Um, I would have to do this for, for the yeah uh, to seek counsel anyway. So um, that that could be an option as well. So Ross, let me ask the the proper procedure. If somebody can't get to the meeting in March, they would contact the SCTA office the day of. I, ideally, if you're going to do traditional teleconference, we do need to put that location on the agenda. Um, and that, you know, I, ideally we're, it's 72 hours, but we'd, we'd like a week if possible to let uh, Drew or I know um, so we can make sure that that's noticed properly. I, I would make a request that you put um, kind of these rules out to uh, the committee members in, in a, in a sure. synopsis. They're, they're there. They're they're in. Yeah. They're in, Make sure we all have a copy of them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, Through the chair, if yep. if I could ask Ross a clarifying question, did I understand you, Ross, to say that AB two four four nine allows us only two meetings 
Is that in a given year or is that for the? It's, it's I believe the calendar year and it's 20%, but we're assuming that there's gonna be one cancellation. Um, yeah, that's under either the just cause or the, yeah, in, in the, the packet we had, um, Corey, um, our uh, county legal um, who, who contracts with us, she put together, um, there's kind of a summary of the teleconference and the AB 2449, and those are both in uh, this agenda. Um, okay, so, so then if we were to accept John's uh, proposal to have us be in this emergency mode for April and July, that would pretty much remove it for the rest of the year? For that option, but I believe I believe the chair is planning to attend in, in person beyond that. Yes. Very well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, we are on to measure M. And I don't have, Ross, is that you again? Or does this go to? Uh... I'll introduce it, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. So as, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as we do each month, we bring you a Measure M project sponsor to talk about the projects that they are implementing with Measure M funds. They tell you how much they've spent, how much, you know, what the status of the project is, how much there is to go. And this year, or this month, we have the Sonoma County Public Infrastructure uh, representative here, uh, Janice Thompson, and she's gonna tell you about several of the projects. So I will hand it over to Janice. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen. And are you seeing that? Yes. Great. Uh, so again, Janice Thompson, Deputy Director, Sonoma Public Infrastructure, honored to be the last virtual representative here. Um, this is what uh, we're going to talk about today. We've got five uh, project areas, Forestville Airport Boulevard, Arnold Drive, Mark West Springs Sidewalk, and Pengrove improvements. Starting with the Forestville area, um, this uh, used to have uh, phase one and phase two, uh, which was a uh, intersection improvements at Highway 116 in Mirabel and a and then. Forestville bypass extension, those have been recently removed from the program. So today I'm gonna to provide an update that we're calling phase three. And as you can see on the map that has uh, several different locations. So it includes uh, improvements at State Route 116 at Mirabel Road, including sidewalk and crosswalk enhancements, there's also a class one bike path along Mirabel Road between 116 and the Forestville Youth Park. Class two bike lanes widening Mirabel Road from 116 to Davis Lane and a left turn lane at Mirabel and Davis uh, intersection. A separate location, there are improvements on State Route 116 at Covey Road sidewalk and crosswalk enhancements, and additionally uh, enhancements at Covey Road and Davis Road intersection. Uh, the county is also working on a uh, improvement project in Forestville. It's titled Front Street Improvements, although it is along State Route 116 uh, between Mirabel Road and Covey Road. There'll be some striping and parking modifications. And we have uh, recently applied for a Caltrans encroachment permit, and we'd like to start construction this year. Um, and then there's the financial chart yeah, here on the slide. 
uh, that shows the Forestville area totaling about 5.8 million and a few different buckets of money. This Excuse slide. me, Janice, could you put that in, in presentation mode so that it, the image is actually bigger? It's, it's a little hard to, for me to see some of the smaller bits. Okay, yes, sorry. Let me figure that out. Click on slideshow. Got it. Is that better? If you hit F7, Janice, it should go into presentation mode. Okay. Hitting F7. Hmm, that didn't work. F5. <laughs> <laughs> now pressing F5. There we go. Did that work? All right. Okay. Now I I have I have to learn how to drive. So hold <laughs> on. Are we driving? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Looking good, were we done with this slide? Okay, sorry, now I can't see y'all. So you'll have to speak up when you want me to take a break. Uh, this next slide shows the existing conditions. Okay, I'm gonna go through this slide and then I'll take a pause uh, on Front Street, which is State Route 116 between Mirabel Road and Covey Lane. Uh, so I don't know if you can see my cursor, but on the left side, this is Mirabel Road. At the far end, on the right side, this is Covey Road. That's kind of what it looks like now. And then my next slide, I'll show you some plans of what we're thinking. And I know this isn't going to be big enough for you to see. I'll do a little talk through, but um, if you can see on the upper left side is, is Mirabel Road. So we're considering some um, concrete bump outs uh, for sidewalk, uh, crosswalk improvements, and we're coordinating with regional parks uh, for this striping joining the West County Trail. I hope you can see my cursor moving here. It's a brown area that's coming in from the south. Um, and so uh, there'll be uh, plans to uh, stripe the bike lane connection to the trail, changing <laughs> some parking, enhancing uh, crosswalks, um, signage. Uh, and, um, so that's kind of what we're looking at uh, right now uh, with the Caltrans encroachment oh. permit. Am I pausing for questions or shall we take them all at the end? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Just for reference, we can see your cursor when you move it around the screen. Okay, great. It's not terribly fancy. Uh, let's see, this next slide is of um, Mirabel Road. So this is uh, kind of preliminary plans for both the class one and two bike lanes that uh, are proposed for Mirabel Road um, with the class one leading up to the park. And that's what's displayed here. And this next slide is of uh, Covey Road and some improvements that we're proposing along there. Um, enhancing the safety and visibility at the intersection of Covey Road, um, and then some intersection improvements up at Davis Road. Now we're on to our second topic, which is the airport boulevard area. And boy, do we have a lot of faces on airport boulevard. Um, I will kind of recap for you. Uh, phase one is west of 101, and it comprises now of, of four different sections. Uh, phase 1A was here near Aviation Boulevard. Um, that project was wide, we widened Airport Boulevard to seven lanes, 
uh, from 101 to aviation and signalized at aviation. That project was complete in 2008. Uh, 1B uh, was recently completed. That's where we widened five lanes between Aviation Boulevard and Regional Parkway. And that project was recently completed in 2021. Phase 1C would be a further widening between Regional Parkway and Laughlin Road. Uh, we applied uh, for the 2021 SCTA funding program. Uh, but this one was not funded, so we're, we're waiting for future funding. Um, and phase 1D is between Laughlin and Ordnance Road, uh, widening to five lanes, bike lanes, and some form of intersection improvement, roundabout or traffic signal. We were successful uh, in this uh, funding request. Uh, so we were awarded 4.5 million, and we have a plan to bring this to construction in 2026. Uh, some other phases, phase two was the extension of Brickway Boulevard to the south, that's on hold indefinitely. Phases three and four, they're on the east side of 101, phase three, completed in 2013, was the widening of Airport Boulevard to three lanes from 101 to Old Redwood Highway and the signalization at Fulton Road. Phase four completed in 2015, uh, five lane widening and the interchange with Highway 101. And phase 4A was the landscaping associated with the interchange project. Construction of that was completed in 2017 and we had a five year uh, plant establishment and watering period, and that was recently completed in December of 2022. And the last phase was the widening of Laughlin Road from Brickway to River Road, and that project is on hold indefinitely. Uh, so this is kind of the funding summary chart for the Airport Boulevard area and uh, we're calling attention to phase 1D, which was the uh, recently successful funding application for SCTA funds uh, for the intersection improvements of Airport Boulevard at Laughlin. Uh, there's a picture of uh, Airport Boulevard before the widening. And then here we have a few pictures of Airport Boulevard widening. Uh, between Aviation and Regional Parkway, which included crossway enhancements, uh, crosswalk enhancements at the rail crossing. And finally, hopefully for the last time, Airport Boulevard Landscaping, which closed the five-year uh, plant establishment and watering period uh, just in December. That's it for the airport boulevard. And now we'll move on to our third project area, which is associated with the Arnold Drive bike lane project. This is between approximately Country Club Drive to Madrone, which is about two miles. Uh, we have a project funding uh, total of about 4.7 million. We've got Measure M bike and ped of 2 million. We have some TDA funds coming. Uh, we recently secured some climate resiliency funding. Um, and uh, so let me get to the next slide on this one. We're currently working on 30% uh, engineering plans and uh, the CEQA environmental process. We're uh, working with Supervisor Gorin's office to uh, determine a meeting date and time for a public outreach meeting. We're looking sometime this March, and we are trying to schedule construction to begin in 2024. You can see these are some pictures of existing conditions, and this would be a cross-section of what we're looking at. 
uh, adding five foot bike lanes. Uh, this is our fourth project to report on. This is the Mark West Springs Road sidewalk project. Um, this is between Old Redwood Highway and Ursuline. Uh, the addition of sidewalk on both sides of the road. Uh, we will be overlaying the road. We're currently under construction, although we're not active due to the weather, uh, but we plan to complete this project this coming December. These are a few photos of the existing conditions out there. In some places, there's an asphalt pathway. Some places, there's not a shoulder. Uh, the project total is 3.3 million. We have 1 million of, of Measure M LSP, and the county is providing the rest of the funding. And our final area is uh, the Penn Grove area. And we have several phases here to go through. Um, phase zero back in 2018 was an origin destination study. Uh, but we currently have a uh, traffic study uh, that we're currently uh, looking at in the Penn Grove area. And uh, there is a project website that you can go and find out about it. Phase one in Pengrove are intersection improvements at Adobe, Main, and Petaluma Hill Road intersection. We're in the preliminary design and environmental stages there. I'll go into detail that in some further slides. Phase two, interchange improvements at Highway 101 and Railroad Avenue, that project has not been started. And phase three and four are intersection improvement projects along Old Redwood Highway, phase three at the intersection of Eli and Goodwin. We were uh, successfully funded by SCTA recently with Measure M money. We're, uh, have a plan to uh, begin construction in 2025 on Eli. Phase four is the Railroad Avenue intersection, and that will follow construction scheduled for 2026. And there's a funding chart displaying those various phases in Penn Grove. Um, this is a picture looking westward on Adobe Road at the intersection of Main Street and Petaluma Hill Road in Penn Grove. This project is going to widen Adobe Road to include a dedicated right turn lane onto Petaluma Hill Road. We're also adding a northbound left turn lane on Main Street to westbound Adobe Road. That's a picture looking north Main Street, Penn Grove, looking north Petaluma Hill Road at the intersection of Adobe Road. Our project schedule, we're currently uh, in the preliminary design and environmental phase. We'll move into right of way and we have a plan to begin construction in 2025. This project's about 4.6 million. Um, this is a photo of phase three, which is uh, the existing conditions, Old Redwood Highway at Eli Road intersection. Uh, this project, we hope to begin construction in 2025. And this would be the phase four, Penn Grove Old Redwood Highway at Railroad Avenue intersection with a plan to begin construction in 2026. And that's the end of my presentation. And I'm available for questions. Would you like me to stop sharing? 
Um, or we may go back. So we may go back. We may go back. Let's see what uh, what the questions come up. Tom Banning is first. Hi, I have a couple questions. First one uh, pertains to Forestville. One of the first two slides you sh showed the new bike path or bike lane two way that runs between the terminus of the West County Trail and Mirabel, is that protected? Looks like it runs along the south side of Front Street or 116. Yeah, I don't know the details, Tom. So I'll know what the picture's gonna tell me. Right there. It looks yeah. like it's protected by a raised concrete curb there from what I can see on the drop plan. Yeah. I take it that, that's what the blue shoulder. zone is. Well, I'm reading the blue zone as a five foot shoulder. And it, it doesn't look like, Tom, we have, we're not at the level of showing exact if there would be any uh, additional safety devices along that path. Okay. Um, so that might come out as a, as a design is refined. Perhaps, yes. Okay. The 10 foot two way. Uh, yes, it is. I have a question. Is it going to be accessible to the blind and folks with disabilities? Yes, it is an accessible path. Okay. Um, second, second question I had is on um, Arnold that's about two miles long. Is any of that protected or is it strictly an attached five foot wide lane on both sides? Again, we're in the preliminary stages. I don't think we're at the level of looking at protective devices. Okay. Okay, that's all I have, thank you. Thanks Tom, Steve. Uh, my question has to do with inflation and how uh, we're managing uh, these projects that are three or four years in the future uh, with that as a threat. Yeah, and um, Steve, we're, we're doing what we can to build in inflation in our project cost estimates. That's good to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Janice, Janice, if it's not a secret, what do you guys, is there like a, a, a fiddle factor that you throw in there that, <laughs> is it 14%, is it 16%? <laughs> no, no. 8%? We're a conservative people, I guess, here, John. We're, we're still down in the single digits. <laughs> okay. Well, and the reason I ask, obviously, is I'm hearing... I'm hearing what the prices are going to, and it seems like it may be a little higher than that. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, and then and then the competitive bid process kicks in and those contractors are giving us good prices. So so good. far we're we're sticking to the single digits. Good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tom. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Janice. Thank you. Um I'm also concerned about the inflation. Um to Tom, back to Tom's comment, you know. Has the does the county have any kind of default design standards for these bike lane projects? You know, I, I'm noticing as I look around, as I drive around the county, and as I ride my bike around the county, um, a variety of different protective devices on different roads in different jurisdictions. And in the case here of Arnold Drive, uh, you know, we're concerned that the de facto widening of that road is going to increase speeds on that already pretty fast corridor. And so we're going to be looking for, as this engineering design gets improved or, or finalized or kind of tightened up, um, we're curious how that issue is going to be managed through the process. And then 
you know, Arnold Drive just being one example, as Tom mentioned up in, in Forestville, that, that could be an issue up there as well. So I'm just curious to hear what your thinking is about uh, whether and how to standardize this going forward in all county projects. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and no, we don't have a particular standard right now, Tom. I see it as being something that we should tackle kind of on an individual road basis, right? All of our county roads can function very differently. And so I think it's kind of a good approach for us at least to um, consider all options. And we're working with uh, bicycle groups and we are very focused on these public outreach meetings um, because we know this is an important project, both to the community and the biking community, especially. And so um, we look forward to getting feedback. And I do think it kind of varies road by road what we what we're able to provide and then and then the appropriate safety devices that we could look at. Oh, OK, I guess I was thinking. Um more along the lines of sort of a like a floor, like a default lowest common denominator that the county would be committing to to ensure one of our objectives in the transportation plan is is safer transit, you know, tra transport. And um and I know that there's new standards that have been, you know, guidelines that have been developed that are being turned into standards and other like another funding stream sources. So I was just wondering if that's something you guys are looking at, or it sounds like, no, it's still an ad hoc, uh, each project on a project by project basis. Well, I would say we share your concern and we uh, attend bicycle, you know, uh, group meetings and we're always looking um, to coordinate and provide the safest uh, new bike lanes. So we definitely share your interest. Um, I'm just not, I would say we're not actively working on developing a standard because it, it, they really do depend on the road and what type of facility we're able to provide. All right. So um, maybe just as we prepare, as we make progress toward this Arnold Drive or you're preparing for the Arnold Drive uh, outreach meeting, it might be helpful to understand like cost differences between paint, that corrugated stripe that I've seen on some of the roads and elevated uh, spike paths as maybe three possible treatments, just so that because the community is going to continue to have these questions, I know, and I I would like to see those conversations be constructive as opposed to, you know, just kind of, we don't have the information in front of us right now. So that might be helpful, especially for this Arnold Drive, because the, the future of SDC and maybe the intensified development up there really could put a lot of pressure on this roadway and a safe, you know, viable bicycle route along there could be a huge boon to the development of that project. So that's something we're thinking about here in the Valley. So thank you for answering all my questions. Great, thank you. Janice, do typically those further details come out at 60 or 70%? Yes, and John, we haven't even had our first public outreach meeting yet. So yeah, I, just, I just want to throw that. Yep. I, I, Thanks. I'm in the business, so I see the 30% and 60%. So Tom, the, the, generally they will be coming out and in time enough to get some cost differential between them. For sure, thanks, John. Yeah, thank you, Harris. Thanks, yeah, I just kind of wanted to, to echo Tom's desire and concern for um, making these bike facilities as safe as possible. Um, one thing to, to add to that is that to make a class four protected bike lane, one would need more width um because the whatever vertical element that is the protection or the separation takes up some width so um, turning those five foot class two bike lanes into class four bike lanes would necessitate uh, 
taking a little bit, making the vehicle lanes narrower, taking them down to 11 or widening uh, the roadway further. But um, Tom, I can send you some stuff that I have about different approaches for protected bike lanes. Great, thank you. Tom Banning. Um, just one follow up for Janice. It'd be interesting to know if the county will, as it gets into more and more projects like this, has some sort of design standard sense on how much protective features there are, perhaps as a function of the speed limit on the road. That is, the faster the car is going by, the more protective elements that there are. Um, Anyway, that's something perhaps for a future conversation, but that's kind of where my mind is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Is that an old hand up or did you have a follow up question, Bertel Ball? I suspect that was an old hand. Sorry, it was, it was, it was a yeah, old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Good report on that. And yeah, are, you, you. are you on to the maintenance of effort? Sure. Me? Or is that, or is that is Shauna, did you want to jump in there with our, our meeting last week with uh, Yes, the please. Over there? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me let's just stop sharing. Yes, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. So, uh, I have an item before you today. This is coming from staff. This is <clears throat> a uh, request for the CAC to consider a recommendation to the board uh, regarding the maintenance of effort for Measure M. The maintenance of effort requirement is uh, it establishes whether or not SETA is in compliance with the Public Utilities Code and with our own maintenance of effort policy that is listed in the strategic implementation plan. So staff is recommending that the CAC consider a recommendation to the board that one jurisdiction, that being the county of Sonoma, is out of compliance with the public utilities code and, um, and measure M. And further staff is recommending that the jurisdiction, that same jurisdiction, the county, have its LSR fund shares reduced by the percentage reported of their three year below their three year rolling average. So what happens is each year uh, we ask for each of the jurisdictions that receives uh, local streets rehabilitation funding from Measure M to report out on their maintenance activities. Uh, and that is specifically because it's it's different than the the LSR reporting that we get on an annual at the annual report level. The maintenance of effort is actually for uh, it's more of an accounting thing. So we're asking them to show us that they did not supplant their general fund monies with Measure M. Stop spending their own money and start spending just Measure M money. That's that's what it boils down to. And so all of the jurisdictions have to report this to us every year. We have changed our policy on the methodology that we use for this reporting. Uh, so this is the second year, the second full year that we are that the jurisdictions are using the methodology that they are now that we have requested of them. And so it measures. Uh, it, there's a three year, there's a three year baseline that was established, that's from year 1718 to 1920. And so each of the jurisdictions reported to us and told us what they, uh, what they spend as maintenance of their general fund in those years. They were allowed to accept certain types of, of activities if they were one time or they fell under other categories and you can see those listed in the policy. Um, and so that established the baseline. We averaged those three uh, those three years as the baseline. Then each year we compare their reporting to that three year baseline, and we use uh, we use three years in a row. So that's a lot of words, but all the jurisdictions 
have report have met their reporting requirement except the, the county. And I think that it is uh, anecdotally, it is because of an accounting practice. It's just how the, the county was accounting for their maintenance activities. But that doesn't change the actual reporting that we got from the county, which is just a little bit below what their three-year baseline was. So we are suggesting that the CAC recommend that we reduce the county's share, which is their annual allocation from the LSR funds, by the amount that they missed their, uh, their maintenance of effort baseline. The TAC has already made that recommendation, and we expect that the county will remedy this. We've had conversations with the county. We expect that the county will remedy this in the following year, but for this year, uh, the policy is clear on what the repercussions are for not meeting baseline. With that, I would take any questions that any of the members have. Do you have a, 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 a quantification of what that reduction would might mean? Yes, it is approximately, uh, it's an estimate, but it would mean approximately $7,500 to the county. Uh, out of the 2.8 million that is their estimated uh, share. Janice, is that gonna make you guys have to shut anything down? No, we won't have to shut anything down. And if I could, I would just like to echo Shauna's thoughts on that, which are, um, we, we recognize this is a, an issue it really is kind of on the back end of an accounting and a coding. Um, we have a we have a twenty four million dollar maintenance budget, of which two point seven two point eight is is Measure M LSR, and we are grateful for that. And we we just missed our target due to some accounting principles that we have defined, we have recognized, and we have a, a plan to rectify going forward. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Rick Lutman. Donna, are you looking for uh, a motion from this body in yes. support of this request? Yes. yes. I yes there, is a, there is a recommendation in the, in the staff report, which is essentially we are asking for a recommendation from the CAC to the board to find that the county is out of compliance by that percentage and to reduce their shares by that much. Yeah, I'll move that. I'll second. Thank you. I saw, uh, see if there's Mark any- Mark Soylent, second. Yeah, got that, Mark, thank you. I just wanted to see if there was any other discussions. I saw Brian with his hand up, but then he disappeared. So I'm not sure if he's still uh, Jerry. Thank you, Thank you, John. Well, I'm just going to explain why I'm going to sustain. As much as we have the explanation, I still don't understand the process. And one of these days, after a few more months, perhaps I'll understand the process. So I think I can't vote on it. I'd be happy to walk you through the process um, offline, if that would help. That, that, that would help. I mean, uh, you just went through baseline and I kind of understand that, uh, but I didn't understand exceptions, et cetera. So the basic, uh, in fact, when we get the, uh, the balance sheet and everything else, um, it's a mystery to me. I know how to read balance sheets, but this one I can't follow. I have, I'll, I'll uh, email you and set up a time when I can walk you through that. Okay. Tom? Tom? Uh, before we vote, I just wanted to say thank you, Shauna, for, you know, pulling this together. And uh, thank you, Janice, too, for your supportive comments there. This is something that, you know, we we are looking forward to you getting the accounting systems and the methods in place so that this isn't a, an ongoing issue in the future. So, um, yeah, it sounds like uh, this is a, a, a step forward and I'm very much supportive. Thank you. And, and Tom, I just wanted to add that Shauna and David and I went over <clears throat> met with staff 
<clears throat> I believe Monday or Tuesday last week. Very, very cooperative. Obviously can't do anything about the, the accounting year just closed, but uh, uh, I do believe that the commitment is there and, and it was good timing to have this come up at this meeting while we had Janice at this meeting. And then moving forward, we think that there'll be a little more clarity in the reporting as we discussed in the January meeting for uh, an extended version. Shauna, did you wanna add anything else to that or Janice? I think you covered it, Mr. Chair. Uh, I Thank don't you. think there are questions. I don't see any other hands raised, so we'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Oh, did have two other questions. Did I jump the gun there? Steve, Steve would you like to? Uh... No, I'm just voting aye. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the confusion of Zoom meetings sometimes. Thank you. Any opposition? Seeing or hearing none, the motion. Any abstentions? Uh, I think Jerry was one. Any other abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Shauna, and thank you, Janice. Okay. Um, Shauna, anything else, or are we on to financial statements with James? You're on to financial statements, Mr. Chair. Wow, we may be on track for a, a scheduled completion on time. This is pretty cool. Go, James. Am I unmuted now? You're unmuted now. Okay, I just got an error. It says Zoom quit unexpectedly. So I'm back. Uh, can you see my share screen, which is the balance sheet in front of you? Yes. Great, great. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to report out on a wealth of financial information for the SCTA and, and specifically Measure M. Uh, this is, you know, these are the actual numbers themselves. It doesn't have the, you know, the great pictures and, and, um, you know, what brings these numbers to life in our annual report or our strategic plan. But I do want to just do the general sharing of there's the balance sheets included in your agenda packet, which is the summary of all of the Measure M programs rolled up. And then there's also the balance sheets in your packet of each individual program, uh, starting with administration, going through all the local streets and roads, local street projects, Highway 101, rail. Then the other two varieties that are within your packet are the um, fiscal year to date expenditures in tabular format, as well as all years. So you can see what's happened since back in 2004. I will bring to your attention just because we'd had a, a good discussion on um, maintenance and effort, which is regard to the local streets and roads program. If you do look at expenditures to date, uh, which is through January of our current fiscal year, that program uh, makes quarterly payments, the local streets and roads programs to our jurisdictions that then they report out to us annually in our uh, Measure M report. This is where you'll see each of those jurisdictions dollars amounts that they've received uh, to date in this column here, this titled LSR. So for what we were just discussing with the county um, public infrastructure, you can see they to date have received uh, $1.4 million, getting close to that, that 2.8 estimate that Shauna was referring to. And, and this is essentially half of the amount that they will receive this year as sales tax increases. These numbers will likely be less than half because going forward into uh, fiscal year Q3 and fiscal year Q4, right, the first two years of the count, first two quarters of the calendar year, uh, we will be having increases in our sales tax revenue. Uh, also within your packet is from our HDL, which is our uh, financial consultant to help us forecast uh, sales tax. Uh, there's a little two-page newsletter they put together, uh, really strong uh, growth of the sales tax, more than was expected when we originally prepared our budget. Uh, they're showing, you know, year-over-year -year increases for Q3 of 2022 at 7.8%. You can see in the top middle of your screen, a lot of that is attributed to, uh, you know, the increase in gasoline prices or fuel that we've seen, uh, as well as, uh, you know, a robust return back to, um, you know, travel and play and dining and hotels. 
um, within the restaurants and hotel categories. Uh, moving, moving through the rest of the information that's here, there's a little more current data within our California forecast provided by HDL. This is for the entire state, not just the you know, county specific sales tax, but you can see their trends going forward. Uh, on page 83, your packet talks about uh, sales tax growth of a pro sales tax growth of approximately 3.8 percent in our current fiscal year, and then flattening out next fiscal year at 0.4 percent statewide. This uh, is is you know following pretty close with what we're doing uh, in Sonoma County, although currently. Uh, to date, uh, to fiscal year to date in Sonoma County, we're tracking it closer to 5% growth this year. James, the last uh, part I, I hate of, to interrupt you, but there, there was a request it, to see if you could expand uh, the information above the 72% level. It's hard, it's hard to see. Absolutely. So, um, so expand, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's zoom in on some of this stuff here. So this is probably the, the the most interesting thing to zoom in on as far as the the newsletter from HDL where we can see um, you know the 72 or 7.8 percent was the increase year over year for Q3 of 2022. You can see those those ticks up in restaurants and hotels as well as fuel uh, and service stations. Uh, the the, the the next one I, I don't have uh, you know a report out on this other than just to give you the big picture numbers which is on page two of the California report so on page two of the California report you'll see in the top right corner which I'll scroll over to now you can see there's a 3.8 percent forecast for fiscal year 22 23 that's the fiscal year you know we're a little more than halfway through now um, and then. Uh, in 23-24, projecting that slowdown with only 0.4% growth. Uh, the, the, the last piece of the financial information within your pocket, packet is really revolving around bond reporting. And this is a requirement because we've, we've issued bonds for the SCTA uh, on three different occasions. Uh, in, in 2008, we issued bonds for both our rail program as well as our highway one, excuse me, in 2008, it was just for the highway 101 program. In 2011, we issued bonds for both the rail program and the highway 101 program. And then in 2015, what we did is we were able to um, refund or refinance in, in, in uh, better terms that some relate to, uh, the 2008 bonds to have a, a significant cost savings as well as draw more money out to deliver that 101 program. Then, then more recently, we were able to defease the 2011 bonds. So these 2011 bond debt service is no longer required of the SCTA, but we are required to report on it and show a footnote that it has been de um, defeased. And then this is just showing the committee that these numbers here of 8.4 or 5.4 million and, and 0.7 million, a, a little, little more than 6 million, that's what our current annual debt service is for the 101 program. And that's what it will be until the end of the sales tax measure when these bonds are closed out. Uh, based on the timing of the bonds, there is no opportunity for early defeasance. They were premium bonds, which essentially requires full payments of principal and interest. There's not an opportunity for um, for early payoff and save that uh, interest payment. With that, uh, I would just uh, close with, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions on this information today. I'm, I'm also anyone who wants to take a deeper dive into any of the financial information that's in your packet, I can make myself available, uh, uh, available to do that. Thank you, James. Anybody have any comments or questions? Uh, I always look to Dennis Harder on these. He seems to be the deep diver on this committee on financial statements. Denny, you still with us? Absolutely, and uh, no questions uh, again. James has done an excellent job in president. That the only thing I'd say, James, that you could add it was on the uh, cash flow statements that they're in a cash basis, and so therefore you're going to add your couple of months uh, uh, drag. So anyway, that'd be the only thing. Other than that, you did eight expert job <laughs> awesome steve bertelbaum <clears throat> i'm back to the inflation issue 
Uh, how is it that inflation is going up at 8% and our uh, income is only going up at 3 or 4%? That's, you know, that, that's, that's a great question. That would be something that I would propose to HDL to try to get a little more feedback from them. Uh, they can dig, dig into the data and see, you know, which items that are in, you know, where there's inflation that are directly affecting the sales tax and which ones are not. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my, my initial gut reaction is that, you know, the, as, as things are getting more expensive, folks aren't buying as much of them. So the growth that we would have seen without the inflation would have been larger sales. Uh, that's that's a, just, you know, one one approach that, that could be, but I can, I can follow up with HDL and get you a better uh, response if you'd like, Steve. Thank you. A great question. All right, James, thank you very much for that. Great report. And we are on to, I wanted to just add one comment too, and that is, uh, Shana, you addressed this, but I would say if anybody else, newer committee members have questions on the, kind of on the, the, the process of the funding determinations and or the different buckets that the funding determinations go into and out of, um, I would highly recommend contacting Shauna, Jerry, as, you, as you're going to do for a, a little uh, independent tutorial session, because there's nothing more frustrating than sitting through a, a meeting with facts and figures flying all over the place and not having a clear picture on how do you get from A to Z. So, Shauna, right. I appreciate you offering that service and, and James, or James. Jerry, thank you. I have to admit, I went back and read the act and all the details on it, so I'd understand the allocations, et cetera. Um, yeah, no. At some, at some meeting, I'd like to bring up the fact I live in Sebastopol, and we're a small town, but we're a service community for 50,000 people, and it looks like the allocations we get are for 7,000 people. Uh, and uh, um, you know, at some point, somebody has to ask the question about that, because uh, how can a town of 7,000 people have five grocery stores? Uh, so it's really a question. Good question. Good question, Jerry. We have the same issue in Snow Valley. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, and let's see, Ross, yeah. you're on. Are we on to our annual report, sir? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief uh, brief overview of the annual report, which is linked in the packet. Um, we do have a limited amount of physical versions of the annual report. So please reach out to me directly if you would like uh, a physical one. And I will go ahead and share it. Is that the correct screen, Drew? Yes, it is. Thank you very much. All right, um, so the 2022 SCTA RCPA annual report provides an overview of SETA and RCPA activities and accomplishments over the past year. Uh, the report provides brief descriptions of these activities and links to additional information when required. Um, I'll provide a brief overview of the report, uh, which you'll find linked in the agenda. So major achievements in 2022 included adopting an equity statement, the TIRCP grant award, completion of carpool lanes on Highway 101 from M Windsor to the Marin County line, uh, Major M goes to Noma progress, big advances in the funding for climate change process, and the completion of a local greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, the SETA funding program applications were evaluated and recommend recommendations completed for recommendation to the, the board. The TERSIP grant provided funding for local transit, and TDA3 and TFCA fundings also supported transit programs as well as bicycle, pedestrian infrastructure, and mode shift programs. The transition from Major M to Go Sonoma continued, and SETA also collaborated with regional partners working towards solutions for flooding and congestion problems on State Route 37. The Highway 101 HOV lanes were completed, as previously mentioned, and a new vehicle miles traveled calculator was launched to assist member agencies in their efforts to comply with the requirements of SB 743. 
In addition to the greenhouse gas inventory, RCPA became the first climate resilience district in California, um, solidifying the structure and the leadership of the funding for climate change efforts and um, adding a new jurisdiction to the water upgrade save program and working with local partners to accelerate EV adoption and carbon sequestration practices. RCPA staff also worked to analyze tree protection ordinances to create a set of best practice recommendations. The annual report concludes with the 2022 financial reports from SCTA and RCPA. And thank you for your time today. Please let me know if you have any questions and a link to the annual report is included in the agenda packet. And like I said, we do have a, a limited amount of physical copies. Um, and if you want one, we will we will get it to you. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Ross. And this kind of goes back to the beginning of the meeting. I, I just wanted to ask the question in preparation for going live in person next month. What would the committee members expect to have in the room for handouts if we don't ask for anything ahead of time? We walk into the King Street uh, conference room, what's there for us? I'm gonna check in with Drew on that. Yeah, don't overcommit now. <laughs> 94 page package. I will have a 94 page packet for Chair Bly. Now, um, so <laughs> I will have some copies printed. Um, it will take some time for me to kind of understand how many to print, um, but I can print more in the office if we run out. So I don't have a number to give because I don't know yet, but I will have some handouts, agendas, et cetera, printed and available for the public when we meet in person. If you want a suggestion, Drew, I would suggest yes. if a committee member wants the full Monty printout, request ahead of time. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, and if you don't have that request ahead of time, maybe only bring one or two copies uh, in the sake of saving a saving a tree. Is that right, that was, yeah, that was my thought too, was to have just the agenda printed out. But if there's anyone who specifically wants a printed copy of the agenda, um, let me know and I will have it ready and available for you at the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, many other Jerry, is that an old hand up? No, it's a new hand up. Okay. Um, it, since I've never been there, and I just noticed on the map where it is, so I usually park there when I'm going over to the energy center. Um, uh, is there a network available on site? Yes. So, so we, uh, we need to download anything. We just pull it down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. there is a public, uh, publicly accessible Wi-Fi okay. here. If I remember from the old days too, Drew, parking is not bountiful. Is that a fair statement? And this is a pretty sizable committee. Are we going to have uh, issues finding parking places in your opinion? No, because the Fifth Street parking garage is less than a block from the um, office it's building. It's so it's park, like if you park at the Fifth Street parking garage, and then just cross over E Street. That'll be the best way to say it. Um, it's hard to gauge level of parking on the streets. Um, well, there's the always riding a bike or walking. Yes. And then the transit mall is on <laughs> about a couple blocks away. So it's all walkable. But yeah. I'm not walking from, from my house. I, I, I live near the Northwest, et cetera, but if you do for me to walk. Okay, well, thank you. And then uh, thank you, Drew. And we're on to uh, any information on the March 13th Board of Directors agenda. Yeah, so let me share my screen. This is the latest draft that I have. Okay, so I should be sharing the right screen. Um, so we will be having our board meeting on March 13 in person. We will be having a Zoom link available for members of the public who wish to watch, but all members will be in person. Um, consent calendar includes the minutes from the previous mo uh, month. We have a Form 700 um, disclosure that goes annually to the board, um, audit service agreements, um, contracts, 
to scroll down a little bit. Um, an item on Hearn Avenue, and then bond disclosure reports. And then for the regular calendar includes um, climate bond legislation, transit integration updates, sustainable community grants, intent to apply, um, adaption planning grant proposal, and then an update for the funding for climate um, initiative. And this is still a draft form of where we're at right now. And I'm here if there's any questions. Fantastic. Thank you. And do we have any announcements? I have one, one brief clarification I wanted to make, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, just regarding some of the Brown Act details, there was, uh, I mentioned the amount of times that AB 2449, the just cause or emergency uh, options can be used. And I wanted to make that clear that that was per individual, not, not for the committee. Um, so each, oh, each okay. individual has two times to use it. I just- Thanks, wanted, Ross, wanted, appreciate that. Yeah, make sure there was no confusion. And, and like I said before, please feel free to reach out uh, directly with any questions. Yeah, no, I took it as per individual, but uh, maybe, maybe it wasn't that clear. Thank you for that. Eris? Yeah, a quick announcement. We just had a new staff person uh, start here at the Bike Coalition today, Ben Adias, who's um, our new bilingual uh education and outreach coordinator, a, a position I have been trying to hire for for two years as we are trying to increase diversity within our board and staff and uh, serve the greater community in a more effective way. So I'm very excited about that. Awesome. Wonderful. And uh, I don't have anything else. This is uh... This is groundbreaking. Thank you guys, we're 10 minutes early. Thank you staff, thank you uh, for all the committee members and uh, thank you to Janice's presentation as well. And uh, we will see you all live and in person next month. So take care, thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.